When writing the book about the Bomber Command Memorial in London, we assembled a seven-man veteran crew and were fortunate enough to have Gordon Mellor as our, as our navigator. What follows are some excerpts uh, from the interview that we did with Gordon. In 2016, I was privileged enough to be able to publish Gordon's full story uh, in the book ETA, which describes uh, his flying days, the night that he was unfortunately shot down, and then his evasion from capture. One of the disturbing statistics related to Bomber Command is the scale of loss on training units and I mean, involving thousands of airmen. The first excerpt is Gordon telling us about one such episode when he was flying from number 27 operational training unit uh, at Litchfield and he's, the pilot he mentions is his Australian pilot Don Jennings. Then the second excerpt Gordon tells of his involvement in one of the turning points of the air war during, during the Second World War the first thousand bomber raid to Cologne on the night of 30th, 31st of May, 1942. Um, uh, we took off and uh, we got up to, what, a couple of thousand feet. And Don was uh, flying and uh, the other chap. I was in the second dicky seat, and I heard uh, over the intercom, he said, that engine is dying. And uh, he said, we'll, we'll, we'll put the, we'll um, um, feather the prop, uh, which they did do. And uh, by this time we were more or less on the circuit of the first, uh, immediately after takeoff, we were more or less over um, Litchfield, and he said, put the other one on full power. He says we can't maintain height on this first one. So they called back to the um, camp, uh, the control tower. And, and someone had said that the, um, our second engine is uh, failing and the other one is dead. Uh, or words to that effect. And uh, so they said make the um, runway, any runway, um, and come in as quickly as possible. Well, we've, first of all, we made sure that we got outside um, Litchfield and we're getting fairly low. And um, up ahead of us was the railway line uh, and the station which we'd arrived at, at Trent Valley. And by the time we got to, um, uh, to the, the station, then I looked out the side windows because it was the old one that got still got some uh, windows there, and I could see the roof of the station up there because there's two tra tracks passed over, and we just cleared the um, uh, the main line up to Scotland and um, crashed in the um, the field. Um, we were lucky in many ways. Uh, in actual fact, I was I was still standing. I was ho holding on to a post, and I should have been sitting down with me back to the front of the. Uh, and, and I was still standing when we hit, and we skimmed it along the ground a bit, came to a halt. Um, when we found the, um, we were in trouble. Then um, I went down to the front and got the front gunner out of his turret because there was a bulkhead there you had to undo so that he could come. Uh, come out, and he couldn't. He couldn't get out himself without help. So uh, we got him out early, and he was up in the um, uh, fuselage with us. And just as well because the front turret got broke off and it rolled across the um, field, a oh, hundred yards nearly. And um, uh, it, was, it was filled with smoke. And um, uh, well, the only way to get out was to go up uh, and out through the Astrodome. The damn thing stuck. But um, was having struggled with it, it then suddenly swung down, and we could pop out of the um, uh, the Astrodome and slide um, down the fuselage onto the wing and head, head first. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, once we were down on the trailing edge, which was um, only just above the ground, one could twist round and uh, 
and get down uh, fairly decently. So um, I knew whoever was in the fuselage behind me could come out the same way. So I went round the front to see um, what had happened to them. And um, uh, both the pilots had got up out of, the, uh, out of their seats and walked straight out of the, um, out of the fuselage. The whole front of it had gone. It was quite amazing. Anyhow, um, Don Jennings was on the ground and he said, I, I've hurt my leg. Uh, he actually walked out of, the, um, out of his uh, position um, a few yards and then he collapsed on the ground. In actual fact, he'd got a broken ankle. And uh, uh, so he just stopped there. Um, the other pilot was out and about and uh, we went round the back and everybody got out except the uh, rear gunner. And he was unconscious, uh, and he was um, in uh, a rather buckled um, a turret. Uh, we couldn't seem to do, do anything with it at all, but fortunately um, uh, there were some uh, railway workers down on the line, and they were, what, a couple hundred yards away, and uh, they came up bringing tools with them, spades and, you know, pickaxes and uh, hammers and things. And uh, uh, he said, what can we do? He said, well, can you get him out? The plane's on fire up the front. And it could spread down, because of course we're fabric covered. It could spread down the fabric. Uh, so um, they, uh, they set about um, uh, getting uh, him out of the turret. He had to break the turret open. They, they, they got sufficient tools to do it. So um, another chap and I, I think it was Wallace operator, we borrowed a couple of shovels from the um, uh, gang. We went up the front and of course um, uh, there was um, one engine which was on fire. Uh, and uh, so we then spent oh, 20 minutes or more shoveling earth onto the engine and the, and the petrol of course was coming out of the broken tanks and uh, the ground was on fire too, but um, uh, we carried on shoveling um, earth on it to try and damp it down. Uh, but then of course you, you shovel up on top of the engine and it gradually drops off, so you had to keep on doing it. And eventually there was a shout from the front, they got him out. And by that time of course there was an ambulance there and there was also um, uh, other vehicle from uh, from the uh, airfield, which was what, only a mile away. And unfortunately, he died. That was a tragedy that night. Yes, we were allocated to an experienced pilot, and um, he took us under his wing. Uh, and uh, we didn't uh, go in ops the first day we were there, but um, uh, they were uh, they were beginning to build up a number of aircraft were, were coming into um, uh, into stay, and um, they'd come from other OTUs, and uh, it was obvious there was something a big was going to come up, up. so. Um, we just sort of rode along with it and the mess, they got uh, additional uh, crews were in and we got a lot of aircraft on that airfield who normally had probably about 16 or 18 I suppose and then we got a, uh, a good few more and um, eventually um, uh, we found we were all on so it was obviously something that was a uh, uh, big in there uh, uh, and it wasn't until we got to um, uh, the general briefing, the navigator's briefing, which I attended, of course, uh, in the beginning of the afternoon. Um, we got a certain amount of information because you had to prepare, prepare a flight plan right from the beginning to the end until you're back at the um, back at base. You had to prepare a flight plan and uh, draw the route up on the charts and. Uh, um, gather weather information and other information all together. So that by the time you came to the general briefing, main briefing, then you've got all of the data you needed 
and um, the group captain was up on the stage, and the flight commanders and the uh, um, squadron commander, and the room was packed. And uh, they then sort of drew the uh, proverbial um, the curtains at one side, and everybody knew we were going to Cologne. Uh, the group captain, oh, I don't think, yeah, I can't talk there. No, the group captain uh, spoke first and he said, well, you can see where you're going now. What you don't know, we're putting up a thousand ra uh, planes. Um, I spent most of my time uh, um, keeping a, a close check on uh, the position of the aircraft so that we kept on track all the way. Mind you, there was, a, there was a dozens all around you, but you couldn't see them, it was all dark. And uh, uh, in actual fact, um, as far as I can remember, we went out over the um, coast uh, of Lincolnshire, which would be uh, probably Maplethorpe or something like that, across the North Sea, um, across somewhere to the west of Ostend. Uh, there was a place which was uh, between uh, two flat batteries, which we managed to slip through at most times. And um, uh, I, I really uh, didn't see much at all, other than I, uh, when we were crossing the coast, then I was down looking, in, uh, looking out of the hatch, the, um, uh, or the front of the aircraft, to uh, see when we crossed the coast and get the time and position. And uh, uh, the rest of the time we relied on wireless and whatever the, the gunners saw. And they'd say, we're coming up to a river, uh, I'll give you the time. And he, he would uh, then say, now, no, now. It was a cast over. But it was up to me to identify the, um, the river and also the part of the river you went over. Yeah. Um, um, we were heading for the Ruhr, of course, and uh, um, uh, we were sort of not in the beginning of the attack at all. It was very well established by the time we got there. So that uh, oh, from, uh, what, 50, 60 miles away, you could see a glow in the sky. And uh, of course it got uh, uh, bigger and brighter as, as you approached the target. And uh, uh, I, I have a suspicion that the, the pilots probably edged a little bit <laughs> Um, if we were, if the nose of the aircraft wasn't pointing directly at it, I got a feeling they probably edged toward it a bit. Anyhow, um, there wasn't much in the way of navigation aids to um, uh, um, make any difference to that on the approach for the last few miles. And it was big. Certainly, it's very really well spread. Um, there were a number of um, uh, artificial fires, bit which the Germans uh, uh, used to. Uh, set up, try and divert you off uh, from the main target, but uh, um, there was no mistaking uh, where we were heading for. So we did. Um, I was, uh, I acted as bomb aimer um, uh, on that, having done the course, and uh, also I was easy to get down into the uh, nose of the aircraft. The other chap, of course, was in the turret, uh, and uh, so we, we, we dropped him. And that, as a matter of fact, I was looking at a picture of the place where was our, our aiming point only yesterday, and that was the cathedral in Cologne, which survived despite it being the aiming point. Um, and, and it survived a, a large number of raids either. Uh, so, um, we dropped our bombs and turned round, um, away from the uh, target area, and we made our way back to base. Was there much opposition to the There was a lot of flat about, and there was, yeah. a, there was a lot of searchlights. I mean, um, Cologne was a major city, and uh, uh, the, um, it is said that the uh, uh, whatever equipment they had, uh, automatic uh, sighting or what have you on any of the gun batteries, uh, uh, that um, the number of aircraft uh, overwhelmed the defence. I'm not sure whether that is true or not. They certainly put up a, a, a fair barrage of, uh, of uh, flak, yeah.